Hey Rock Buddies, it's Papa. I hope you guys are doing well. Good to be talking to you again, my friends. You know, we had a video where we talked about <clears throat> felsic igneous rocks and their metamorphic equivalents. Then we had a video where we talked about intermediate igneous rocks and their metamorphic equivalents. Well, this video is going to be about, guess what? Mafic igneous rocks and their metamorphic equivalents. So, and uh, if you've, as usual, if you find this uh, video helpful, please subscribe. Uh, it really keeps me going and encourages me a lot. So, without further ado, here we go. Mafic igneous rocks and their metamorphic equivalents. In the video on felsic igneous and metamorphic rocks, we learned that felsic rocks are rocks that are high in quartz and potassium feldspar and low in iron and magnesium. In the video on intermediate igneous and metamorphic rocks, we learned that intermediate rocks have medium amounts of quartz and feldspar and medium amounts of iron and magnesium, but not a super abundance of each. Now, mafic igneous and metamorphic rocks, as you may have guessed, are low in quartz and feldspars, low in quartz and potassium feldspars, high in calcium feldspar, high in iron, and high in magnesium. I think I'm getting a little confusing about felsic intermediate and mafic elements versus felsic intermediate and mafic minerals. So let me clarify a little bit. Quartz, which is made of silicon and oxygen, is a felsic mineral. So that means silicon and oxygen are felsic elements, in my view. Potassium feldspar is also a very felsic mineral. That means potassium and aluminum, which potassium feldspar contains, are felsic elements, in my opinion. <clears throat> Now let's go, muscovite also is a felsic mineral because it has uh, the same elements as potassium feldspar, which are aluminum, potassium, silicon, and oxygen. It just has a little extra chemically added water. Um, and then let's go to biotite. Biotite has the same elements in it as muscovite, but it adds some iron and some magnesium. So iron and magnesium uh, are basically mafic elements, and the more of them you have, the more mafic your rock is. Intermediate rocks have a little bit of iron and magnesium, so they're intermediate. Um, mafic rocks, the ones we're going to talk about today, like basalt, gabbro, diabase, and their metamorphic equivalents, metabasalt and amphibolite, have a little bit of quartz, so that means a little bit of silicon, and a lot of iron, magnesium, and calcium. Iron and magnesium and calcium are mafic elements, and they make mafic minerals like uh, hornblende, uh, pyroxene, and uh, olivine. So I hope that helps on that bit and makes it a little more clear. Let's keep going. Okay, we're looking at a picture of gabbro. Gabbro is a mafic intrusive igneous rock. You can see the uh, big black mineral grains. Those would be pyroxene or possibly hornblende, not biotite. And uh, if you give these black grains the nickel scratch test, they should not scratch. Uh, whereas biotite will scratch. Remember, when you do the scratch test to focus on uh, the black mineral, make sure you're scratching that and not the other. The white mineral is calcium-rich feldspar, and calcium-rich feldspar is almost always white, unlike potassium feldspar in felsic rocks, which can be white, pink, reddish, orange, and even green. And another thing about the calcium-rich feldspar crystals is they almost always are aligned in uh, long linear shapes or patchy uh, kind of shapes with ragged edges. Geologists call this lathe-shaped crystals. That's an easy way to help you uh, separate these calcium feldspar crystals from sodium and potassium feldspar crystals. The main way to tell what minerals you have in rocks is 
based on whether they're felsic, intermediate, or mafic rocks. You know, felsic rocks aren't going to have any calcium feldspar in them and very little sodium feldspar. Uh, they're not also not going to have uh, pyroxene as a black mineral. They may have biotite, that sort of thing. Now, look how large the mineral crystals in gabbro are. Why is that? The reason is gabbro is an intrusive uh, igneous rock. It formed deep, deep underground. That meant it cooled slowly, and the slower a uh, magma cools, the more time the crystals have to grow large. Here we have another mafic intrusive igneous rock called diabase. Diabase also formed underground as a magma, but look how small the crystals are, much smaller than gabbro. The reason is that the diabase uh, was intruded much closer to the surface of the earth because diabase magma is the magma that is, uh, does the rifting when a rifting event occurs and it comes up close to the surface to split the crust into pieces, breaking up a supercontinent into smaller continents. Look at these fantastic black diabase dikes that intruded what is more than likely granite rock. Um, that's visual evidence of a huge rifting event. Maybe uh, most likely the rifting of Pangaea, our most recent supercontinent. And remember, diabase has the same minerals in it that gabbro has. That would be pyroxene, maybe a little horn blend, and calcium-rich feldspar. Now for a mafic extrusive igneous rock, basalt. This is the kind of lava that you see in those uh, nature shows about Hawaii and the lava that's erupting there. Um, do you see mineral crystals? No, you see a lot of holes which represent gas uh, that uh, came out of the rock as it came to the surface and expanded. But you don't see mineral crystals. That's because it came out onto the surface so quickly and cooled so quickly that the mineral grains had little or no time to grow. Here's the stuff that you can buy in bags at Lowe's and Home Depot for your grill or for landscaping, but it is um, basalt lava. It's more um, low density cinder type basalt because it's very uh, full of holes from g expanding gas bubbles. Usually with a basaltic eruption, first you get these cinders blown out of the volcano and then comes the more solid lava flow. This is basalt lava in its columnar form, and you usually find this uh, in ocean crust on the bottom of the ocean. This columnar shape shows the kind of the assembly line production that happens with ocean crust. Each of the columns represents a squirt of ocean crust, and it moves over, uh, and then another squirt comes out, and the whole thing moves over like a conveyor belt, and that creates the bottoms of our ocean. They're made of basalt lava on top with a pool of gabbro pluton at the bottom. It's okay, rock buddies. We've just looked at um, mafic igneous rocks, uh, mafic igneous intrusive rocks, which would be gabbro and diabase and mafic igneous extrusive rocks, which would be basalt. And remember, these mafic igneous rocks are all high in iron and magnesium, which are mafic elements. And these mafic elements give rise to mafic minerals like hornblende, pyroxene, calcium feldspar, and olivine. So now let's look at the metamorphic equivalents of these mafic igneous rocks. Here we go. Hey, wait a minute. This says gabbro. Well, really and truly, it's metagabbro. Since I live in the metamorphic uh, capital of the uh, eastern United States, I was not able to find some gabbro. But gabbro and metagabbro, number one, they have the same minerals in them. Uh, number two, they have very similar 
mineral crystal sizes and they look similar. So we're gonna call this Metagabro. And by the way, how do these uh, mafic igneous rocks get turned into metamorphic rocks? Well, the subduction process does a lot of that, and um, but mostly the crashing process where one continent crashes into another one in the process of building a supercontinent. Um, rocks are, igneous rocks are pushed deep down into the mantle or toward the mantle, but under great heat and great pressure uh, and so their mineral assemblages have to change or rearrange in order to accommodate those great pressures and temperatures. And that's how we get metamorphic rocks. If basalt lava, especially ocean crust basalt lava, gets metamorphosed and pushed up on land, it becomes what we call metabasalt. We call it metabasalt because we pretty much uh, are confident that it did begin as uh, ocean crust and was pushed up on land. A couple of other ways that we know that this uh, was ocean crust pushed up on land is because it covers a very large area of ground. It's a, it's a big geologic formation, uh, something that you would expect uh, from a big hunk of ocean crust being pushed up on land. Another way we know is that because it has undergone what we call reverse metamorphism or retrograde metamorphism. When the ocean crust was involved in a crashing event, first it got pushed down under great heat and pressure and it was metamorphosed. But then as it was pushing and shoving continued, it was raised back up and slid onto the continent. That uh, caused uh, the pressure and temperature to go in the opposite direction and cause reverse metamorphism. During retrograde or reverse metamorphism, mafic minerals turn back, back the clock and become in more intermediate minerals. And so the hornblende and pyroxene in basalt ocean crust will revert to biotite and chlorite, which is a greenish colored uh, mineral. Hot water plays a very important role in this retrograde metamorphism too. This hunk of metabasalt is called the Ropes Creek metabasalt, and it was most likely formed during the uh, Taconic mountain building event and probably pushed up on land during the Acadian mountain building event. The presence of hot water, the uh, mafic minerals turned into chlorite and biotite and became schisty, and the surface that you're looking at uh, it's hard to see, but it's a shiny kind of a schisty surface with chlor uh, exhibiting chloride and biotite. Geologists call this ocean crust that's been reverse metamorphosed greenstone. Here's some Lawrenceville, Georgia metabasalt, um, and you can see the uh, metamorphic banding here. That lighter colored zone is could be quartz, but I'm thinking it's a mineral called epidote that often is an alteration mineral of uh, mafic rocks. And here's a mavic rock that is very most likely to be metabasalt, and this comes from the Carolina super terrain. Because this green schist has both biotite and chloride, a nickel can scratch it. Most of the time when we encounter these mafic metamorphic rocks, we can't really tell if they were once uh, ocean basalt or uh, extrusive basalt lava flows on land or even gabbro or diorite that's been metamorphosed. In that case, we call them amphibolite. At any rate, they do contain those same mafic minerals that we've been talking about, pyroxene, maybe some hornblende, and calcium-rich feldspar. One thing about amphibolite that we find is it's really hard and crystalline. It's, that means it's really hard to crack with a hammer and it does not have the reverse metamorphism associated with it like the uh, ocean crust basalt that gets pushed up on land. Also with amphibolite, we don't usually find it in these very large uh, exposures like we would if it were ocean crusts. It's really in these uh, scattered pods and that kind of tells us that it's very likely to be metamorphosed uh, above ground basalt lava flows and maybe gabbro, meta gabbro, or um, meta diabase. And finally, uh, when I go out into the field and find these 
amphibolite blobs. They're usually in these rounded shapes that are kind of by themselves and they exhibit this onion skin kind of weathering pattern that's called spheroidal weathering, uh, which granite also can display. And finally, finally, if you're not all glassy-eyed and ready to fall over yet, uh, one last mafic rock, uh, metamorphic rock, and this is called mafic tough or mafic metatuff. And it, it is not so easy to uh, identify in the field, but its main characteristics are that it's um, usually very deteriorated because uh, of its original low density when it was uh, blown out onto the surface. And it's chock full of iron, and iron is one of the most erodible of all minerals, so it's undergone a tremendous amount of um, weathering and erosion and it looks almost like a dirt clod. Sometimes you see a really dark core in the middle of one of these dirt clods that could have been relict, what they call relict pyroxene or a uh, relic mafic mineral that's still in the process of, of uh, rotting or weathering into this um, brownish iron rich uh, dirt cloddy thing. Okay, rock buddies, thank you so much for hanging in there with me. Uh, and also thank you so much for subscribing to my channel. I really do appreciate that so much. Um, there's going to be one more uh, video on igneous rocks and their metamorphic equivalents. And that's going to be about ultramafic igneous rocks and their metamorphic equivalents. So stay tuned for that in the next video. Eventually, after that, I'm going to be making you guys your very own online digital rock collection with um, all kinds of... Uh, igneous sedimentary and metamorphic rock pictures for you to download onto your computer or your phone so again thanks so much for subscribing and here's Papa saying happy rock hunting to all my rock buddies Papa out <laughs>